So perhaps I can start introducing ourselves. Actually, without intending it, I think it's an excellent order of the presentations because Lutz and I were looking at each other and thinking we disagree <laughs> with this view and we're actually um, presenting something different. So I'm an archaeologist. I consider myself, let's say, a hardcore archaeologist. I try to be up to date with archaeological theory, social theory, anthropological theory. And I teamed up with Lutz, who is a computer specialist. And what we will talk about today is not a case study, but just a reflection on uh, our discussions on what we can and cannot do in terms of um, network analysis as an analytical tool, trying to detect agency, human agency, object agency and events, because I do think uh, they matter. I don't entirely disagree with you. I'll try to avoid, um, let's say, turning my discussion into the presentation. So I'll try to move on uh, a little bit. So the last couple of years, we have seen several case studies in which network analysis was used as an analytical tool, um, going from looking at intercultural interaction, intervisibility networks, regional interaction, the rise of regional identity, archaeologists have managed to use network analysis um, to look at um, meaningful changes in the past. But as Anna Collar and colleagues also have very well um, put it, uh, we might be experiencing uh, inflations and deflations in archaeological network theory in the sense that after a peak of inflated expectations, we went through disillusionment and now um, we are rising up again in a slope of enlightenment and um, moving towards productivity, meaning that we are critically reflecting about what we are doing, why are we doing it, and does it actually um, make sense? And Lutz has a lot of things to say about that. Right, yeah. Can you hear me without the microphone? I typically talk quite low. Can you hear me in the back? Perfect, thanks. I, I like it to walk up and down, that's why I'm doing that. <clears throat> okay, no, actually I went back to that on purpose. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, one of the biggest questions is actually a very interesting interaction with her. If you think I have a fight with Isa, I have a lot of fight with her as well. <laughs> <clears throat> one of the questions I think that we need to ask in this context, this is a typical hype cycle slide. The question is always, are we talking about new technology? And now is the question of from what perspective are we talking about? And that's something we need to consider carefully. Are we talking about social network analysis from the perspective of sociology? We're over there. Are we talking about the application in archaeology? We're here. And that's one of the risks, because actually where sociology, where social networks come from in terms of sociology is a simple link between people, nothing else. You can link it to anything. It's a graph theory. It's actually not even a statistical model or anything. It is a simple graph linkage model. So all you want to achieve by that is to identify basically who knows who. That's the very simplest model of social networks. And it's been applied to things like spreading disease. Because if I know someone, I have contact with him, that's the route that a disease can take. So the problem with it is, and that problem is also the same for social and, uh, sociology, is that you can view that same distribution of information in different ways. You can cluster it according to different energy coefficients. You can, you can aggregate it and visualize it according to different questions that you ask the network. The main problem is, however, what is the relationship between the question you're asking and the way you cluster it? There's a high risk, even in sociology, that you just change the network until you get a result that you like. And that's your interpretation. So back to you. Continue the fight. <clears throat> 
Well, so Lutz tell me, tells me that I might be talking a lot of nonsense. I'm an archaeologist, I know about objects and I all about that. theory. <coughs> but then Lutz comes and says, ah, but you're applying things that, that, that might not, not make sense. Um, so we use things like UCI net, Gefi, Visone, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But as an archaeologist, I confess that I do lack the mathematical skills to understand what, what I'm actually doing. Another thing, and this is where I think we move towards the discussion, it's also why I applied with this paper to this session, it ties into um, models, um, less the agent-based modeling, but the thing, um, what do we think about? Um, recent critiques to archaeological applications of network analysis have come from people who work, uh, broadly speaking, within an actor network theory framework. So that basically says uh, it's not only people that have agency, it's also objects that have agency. They reject all classifications of objects and try to look, uh, to put it uh, in a simplistic way, at a chain operatoire. So um, instead of social classes, they look at how things are made, how social situations are made, how objects are made. There are some valid points of critique. Um, I do think we need to take a number of these observations into calculation. On the other hand, I do believe we can construct models um, and we can even rise to a higher level in which there are no human agents. I agree we can do that. However, I do believe there has to be some kind of interaction between the levels, which would also be my point of discussion towards you. Um, because we can represent objects would be first just one object related to another one, or um, objects related to people. Um, we might try to make it more complex and have several layers, but that's actually where the challenge lies uh, from a, a computer kind of perspective or, 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 or an, an um, informatics kind of perspective. So, however, we do think not that there are really solutions, but we have agreed after a lot of fights that um, there might be some, some steps that we can take to move towards something that might one day uh, take the shape of a solution. Mm -hmm. um, and the first thing I think we should address is the uh, issue of data gathering. So sociologists, pay a lot of attention to uh, the collection of data. What kind of data? What questions do they ask? How do they structure it? But as far as I know, archaeologists do not spend any attention to that. The only issue that has come up is the fact of missing data, um, but less about structuring data uh, and what kinds of information we can use. And actually, um, it's also one of the things about archaeology that comes in and ties into the discussion I heard this morning, um, I think very often archaeologists conflate the very different levels of information they're dealing with. It's not about just single objects, it's about collections of objects that might have been meaningfully deposited. Um, at least meaningful for the actors themselves, whether on a very long or a very long time scale or a very macro level, whether it's important or not, um, that can be a point of discussion, but for the people themselves it was important. Um, then there's also landscapes, interacting with the landscape, but also the landscape uh, on the long term. So there's actually a whole kind of, um, a whole different world that can be constructed and we need to be aware about these different levels uh, of information. Um, one thing I have tried to do in my own research is try to add complexity by adding attributes that would link in uh, one way to the critiques that have been formulated by the actor network people. And I'm very interested to see what the colleagues are going to do with uh, Tim Ingold's notion of meshwork. So we also had, um, for example, Angus Moll or Ian Hodder trying to work uh, with this kind of um, actor network and linkages between objects. Um, but it remains a huge challenge uh, to add this complexity, uh, as Lutz tells me. So, <laughs> back to me. Okay. <laughs> to okay. Um, 
saying all that. It's not like I, I don't want to, even though I constantly complain to ESA about, right, modeling and simulation is not that easy, right? The thing that I would immediately tell in your case is, well, they're open system and they're closed systems. You assume a closed system. It's not. Human is not a closed system. Nothing in nature is a closed system. But having said all this, that does not, and I want to stress that, mean that simulations are of no value, right? Or that you should not try to model or any of these things. What I'm saying is you need to understand the model. And that's a more complex thing that you'd, that you'd imagine. And actually, when I'm with, with um, Liebe, I feel a bit like, I'm, I, I don't want to say that I'm in, as intelligent as, as Albert Einstein, not at all, just I'm from Ulm, so hence birthplace of Albert Einstein. Um, so the, I, I feel like this is a fight, unfortunately. And I, you might have noticed in plenty of presentations of the CAA that there is a tendency to some of the presentations trending very much to being computer scientist centric with sometimes, I don't want to blame everyone, not at all, there are brilliant presentations here, sometimes a weak archaeological stance. And there, there are plenty of archaeological presentations with sometimes a weak computer science stance. This is not a complaint. This is normal. We need to have this conversation. We need to find a common way. So what I'm trying now, or more correctly, what we've been trying over lunch, over lunch fight, is try to find a meta model of how to model, right? Um, and now you can start all the discussion about the complexity theory behind that. Um, okay, so what we've got here essentially is um, the steps involved, we try to shape them, and, and please do criticize and add to them, because the point that we try to add here is try to develop a roadmap of how we can actually try to shape how we do modeling, and in particular in this case, SNA is better. So we are not the geniuses who can define it all, we rely on your feedback. So essentially what happens, and bear in mind, SNA comes from a completely different background. It had its own model and theory, which was not even mathematical in the first instance. And that these models have developed a lot of different functions for the energy function, for clustering, for visualization, and so on. And if you apply any of the data that you got to the SNA, you can generate an infinite number of different networks all differing in the function that you actually apply. Um, the problem there is, and this, this is probably for, for anyone who's more on the computer science side, they will automatically say, yeah, we encode the assumptions. Right, this is how you do any ABM model and so on. You encode assumptions in the function that you're putting. We had the model of, of different retaliation, of game theory. This is already an assumption in itself, but it's it is encoded as a mathematical function. If you read a modern SNA tool, you will get a lot of assumptions, such as SR energy. Anyone can tell me what this means for human interaction? That is the problem. On the other hand, the other way around, we as, as computer scientists, if I say we as computer scientists, if I can say that, we have very little understanding of the assumptions and interpretations that you put in the way of gathering data, structuring data and interpreting it. But you also have your own models behind it. You have your functions behind it, which for us, as us hidden, as some of the functions are for the archaeologist. The problem is that with modern technologies such as SNA, we seem to have something that's in between both. And there have been a lot of development to address what you've been addressing just right now, to try to map multiple attributes. Well, how do you do that? You multiply them with a vector, and the vector is the weight over a function of energy. Again, tell me what encodes best the relationship between human, human interactors. Similar to statistics, yeah, there have been statistical approaches to that. But again, the question is, what is more similar to something else? Take, for example, that two, two um, ceramics are red, but they're actually basing on different chemical constitutes on why they are red. Are they similar? How similar are they? These things are very difficult to encode, and this is the kind of conversation we need to talk about, because if you look at it, your assumptions may be wide, but it shapes the way you're gathering your data. And that in itself means that only certain of that can be actually applied to the model you're using. 
And on the same side, these assumptions flow into, the mathematical assumptions flow into the way you're shaping the network. Problem is, at this stance, both people think they know what they are talking about and use it as a feedback. They get the result, they say, yeah, that fits my model, or it doesn't fit my model, depends. But they haven't yet, at this point, talked to each other. Right? What we need to focus on, really, is this in between. And now going back to your Gartner hype cycle, to how technological de development is. What you can see in this is basically the initial, the initial hype, basically, right? In this initial hype, you try a lot of random exploration. You try your networks, and you see results. And the results are promising. And you think, like, oh, right, that explains a lot. And it may. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying everything, the results are necessarily wrong. Not at all. What I'm saying is that you still need to try to apply the right uh, functions and methods into that. And this is the big risk. This is the risk that we're currently facing. Is that now that we start to understand better, that we start talking and fighting each other personally, that we as mathematicians, right, I'm not a mathematician actually, we say, well, this, this can't be encoded. I don't understand the complexity of humans. As opposed to the archaeologist, you, you would say, I don't understand what you mean by an energy function. But we do that, and you can already see in many, uh, in many of the presentations today that there is first knowledge being put into how you shape the model, how you interpret that, and how you change the cost functions. But there is the big risk, if you go back to the original slide, that this means that there is a lot of disillusionment now. So we need to start with the next step. We need to analyze from both sides what is the relationship between these models, between the cost functions, and actually in terms of how can you interpret them on a human level. Right? So this is basically, even though there is no solution right now, this is basically, it says we need to talk more. As computer scientists, we still need to learn a lot from you. We make things such as the, the, what I told you about the red ceramics, is something that a computer scientist doesn't even understand. They're both red. This is a link. Perfect. <laughs> right? But you always, constantly, this is why I'm here, this is why I like to talk with you people, you have a much bigger big data process than any other computer system in the world. You are constantly cross-referencing not only the data set you gather from one side, but across regions and across time. Nobody else does that. Computer science still needs to learn from that. So don't get me wrong along the lines. Not a complaint at all. We need to learn from you. We need your input. Right? So, basically, to, start, uh, to end with an encouragement, and you can have the last word. We are on the right path. Let's keep going there. Let's not fight each other over the little details or whatever. Let's sit together go through the very nasty and terrible process that it's okay that you go out, go out with a bloody nose. Right, let's get start fighting. Well, thank you, Lutz. <laughs> I didn't really have <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> uh, any, anything to add to that? Perhaps tie into the discussion and tie into also recent discussions about network analysis and the possibility to do that, especially the um, attacks that have been... Have been uh, formulated from the corner of actor network theory. So um, one of the things I've thought about during your talk, um, and I agree it might be totally irrelevant when you, when you look at uh, archaeology from a macro perspective, but for people it is important. Um, human agency, object agency, why do you where do you place that and why do you completely eliminate it? Is it because it is too difficult to include? Is it really not important or events not important? I mean, if I think about a figure like Hitler, for example, yeah, okay, it might be an event from a world scale perspective, but for human lives, it really had a huge impact. Um, how do mm -hmm. we, yeah, I mean, how do we deal with that? And, and on a broader level, how do we model these kind of things? Yeah, he wasn't a grain of sand. But <laughs> yeah, well, actually, he was. <laughs> 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 <laughs>